In the early 20th century, one man proposed draining the Mediterranean Sea. No, it's not satire. It was an actual $1 trillion blueprint to redraw borders, unite continents, empower all of Europe. It was called Atlantropa. And despite sounding like science fiction, it was dead serious. But beneath the engineering marvel lay something deeper. Ambition, empire, and control. The question wasn't how it would work, it was what could possibly go wrong. In the chaos after World War I, as Europe reeled from ruin and identity loss, one man dreamed, not of rebuilding, but of remaking the entire world. His name was Hermann Sergel, a German architect with a vision so massive it made skyscrapers and highways look like toys. His idea? Drain the Mediterranean Sea. Not completely but enough to lower it by 200 meters, exposing millions of square kilometers of new land. Imagine a new coastline for Africa, in Italy that stretches like a dagger into the sea, fertile farmland where once there was only water, and at the heart of it all, a super dam at the Strait of Gibraltar, the gateway between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. This dam would do more than just block water it would generate enough hydroelectric power to fuel all of Europe. On top of that, land bridges would physically connect Europe to Africa, forging a continental superstate. Sergel called it Atlantropa. It wasn't just a plan, it was a civilization reset. He envisioned a peaceful union between continents, where war was obsolete and energy flowed endlessly from nature itself. It was utopia engineered. But while the maps were speculative, the intention was deadly serious. Atlantropa was presented in books, lectures, and even exhibition halls. This wasn't just a fringe fantasy. This idea was pitched to world leaders. A project born not from greed, but from desperation. The kind of idea that comes when a continent decides the old world must be replaced by force, by faith, or by flooding. And believe it or not, this was just the beginning. Atlantropa wasn't just about lowering sea levels, it was about remaking Earth, one dam at a time. At the heart of the plan stood a 35-kilometer-long dam across the Strait of Gibraltar, a concrete leviathan, wide enough to block the Atlantic from refilling the Mediterranean. But that was just the beginning. Secondary mega dams would seal the Dardanelles and the Suez Canal, isolating the sea completely. Giant hydroelectric turbines embedded in these colossal barriers would churn endlessly, producing so much energy it could potentially power every factory, home, and city across Europe. But Circle's ambitions didn't stop at energy. As the sea receded slowly over decades, entire stretches of new land would rise from the depths. Thousands of square kilometers of seafloor would be turned into farmland, settlements, and highways. Artificial ports would be built where the ocean once ruled. In southern Europe and northern Africa, new megacities were plotted out on blueprints like a game of Sim City on steroids. The Sahara flooded. Well, parts of it anyway. Massive inland seas would be created using redirected water to stabilize temperature and grow crops, transforming hostile deserts into habitable oases. And then came the borders. With the new land, some nations would double in size, others disappear entirely. This wasn't just landscaping, it was geopolitical surgery. An Earth reimagined not by war or peace treaties, but by sheer willpower and concrete. This was terraforming before the world even existed. It was like building multiple Panama canals all at once. Just take a moment and picture it. Satellite images redrawn, sea turned to soil, Europe and Africa shaking hands across new bridges. I mean, this wasn't just a plan, it was a God-level act of creation. But in all of this, one question still remained. Could humans even pull it off without pulling the planet apart? By the 1920s, Europe wasn't just wounded, it was unraveling. The First World War had left its cities shattered and its populations traumatized. 
The Treaty of Versailles sowed bitterness instead of peace. And then, the Great Depression rolled in, crippling economies and toppling governments. In this chaos, Hermann Sergel looked around and saw a continent not just in crisis, but in need of reinvention. He believed the answer wasn't within Europe's borders, but just south of them, across the Mediterranean. Sergel's Atlantropa project wasn't pitched as mere infrastructure, it was a salvation plan. Drain part of the sea, build dams to harness immense hydroelectric power, create millions of hectares of new farmland, and finally give Europe a unifying mega goal to prevent further wars. To him, the logic was pretty simple. If the continent could work together on something this massive, then maybe it could stop tearing itself apart. Jobs, energy, food, and most importantly, peace. He believed the future of Europe depended on turning the Mediterranean into a giant construction site. But there was more to the vision than wires and concrete. At its heart, Atlantropa was a bold and unsettling attempt to reshape the map. Sergal imagined a merged Euro-African supercontinent, with economic interdependence knitting north and south into one powerful block. But this wasn't a partnership of equals. Africa was not seen as a co-author of the dream, but as a resource bank, a continent to be engineered, irrigated, and integrated without ever truly being consulted. Critics quickly picked up on this contradiction. One review at the time bluntly stated, this isn't unity, it's conquest by blueprint. And that was the problem. Beneath the promise of peace and power was a quiet assumption. That control over nature, over land, and over people was the path to stability. Peace through control was how Sergal framed it. But history tells us the truth. Control for one often means sacrifice for another. And in Atlantropa's case, it was never entirely clear who would be asked to pay the price. If Atlantropa had ever broken ground, it wouldn't have just changed the map, it could have rewritten the rules of nature violently. On paper, the project looked like progress. Power for millions, land for agriculture, and unity across two continents. Sounds pretty good. But beneath that glossy surface was an environmental time bomb. The Mediterranean Sea, with its delicate balance of salt, current, and temperature, supports thousands of marine species, many of which exist nowhere else in the world. Lowering the sea by over 200 meters would have turned it into a shallow, brackish graveyard. Fish, coral reefs, entire ecosystems would vanish, not over centuries, but likely within just a few years. And it wasn't just the ocean that would suffer. The massive shift in water volume could have reversed the flow of rivers in northern Europe, leading to flooding in places like the Netherlands and Germany. Salinity levels would have gone haywire, making agriculture on the new land questionable at best and toxic at worst. Coastal regions from Spain to Egypt built around a stable sea would have collapsed into economic and ecological ruin. And the weather patterns? They'd be total chaos. The Mediterranean actually plays a quiet but critical role in moderating the climate for southern Europe, North Africa, and even influences the monsoons in Asia. If you remove or alter that system, you don't just risk droughts or floods. You risk both, unpredictably. Even the ground beneath Atlantropa wasn't safe. Draining the sea would have redistributed enormous pressure on the Earth's crust, potentially triggering earthquakes in seismically sensitive zones. What Circo proposed wasn't just a hydro project, it was tectonic surgery. As one modern engineer put it, it's like trying to perform hard surgery with a bulldozer. And that's not even accounting for the absurdity of the tech involved. In the 1930s, Circo's tools were mostly theoretical. No dam of that size had ever been built. Even today with our best machines, the sheer scale makes engineers laugh or shudder. Because what Atlantropa asked of humanity was nothing less than godlike control over nature. And nature rarely takes orders without consequences. At first, Atlantropa captured imaginations across Germany and Italy. The idea of reshaping continents, harnessing endless energy, and creating new lands sounded like the ultimate solution for a war-torn Europe desperate for hope and power. But excitement soon gave way to cold reality. The world simply wasn't ready or willing to buy into such an audacious scheme. Even Germany's closest allies thought the project was more fantasy than feasible. 
Then, World War II exploded onto the scene, crushing the fragile momentum beneath the rubble of global conflict. Resources, attention, and priorities shifted entirely. Rebuilding shattered cities and economies became the urgent mission, not dreaming about redrawing coastlines. As peace settled, the world's gaze turned inward toward healing and sustainability. The rise of environmental science in the 1960s brought fresh scrutiny to mega-engineering projects like Atlantropa. What was once seen as visionary was now criticized as colonialist overreach. An arrogant attempt by Europe to control nature and dominate Africa without regard for ecosystems or people. Public opinion shifted decisively against it. Atlantropa's sheer scale, its hubris, and its blind spots to ecological realities became impossible to ignore. It was no longer a beacon of progress, but a warning tale. One historian summed it up perfectly. Atlantropa didn't fail because it lacked vision. It failed because it lacked humility. It was a dream that was too big for its time, a reminder that even the boldest ideas must bow to the limits of nature and human cooperation. And so, the grand plan to drain the Mediterranean quietly faded into the archives of history. Today, nearly a century after Atlantropa's bold blueprint, the world hasn't lost its appetite for colossal, planet-changing projects. Saudi Arabia's NEOM and The Line promise futuristic cities that defy conventional urban life. Dubai's artificial islands stretch into the sea like man-made miracles. And China's South North Water Transfer Project aims to reroute rivers across thousands of kilometers. Even Elon Musk's Mars colonization dreams echo that same urge to reshape worlds on a grand scale. But beneath this ambition lies a question. Are we still drawn to mega solutions that brush aside ecological warnings? History whispers caution. Atlantropa's failure wasn't just about engineering limits but about ignoring nature's complexity and human consequences. The pattern keeps repeating. The bigger the problem, the more outlandish the fix proposed. Mega dams, sprawling mega cities, massive water transfers. They all share Atlantropa's DNA of scale and hubris. As climate change tightens its grip, debates over geoengineering and radical urbanism reveal that same tension. Can humanity tame nature with sheer will and technology, or are we repeating the mistakes of the past? Atlantropa remains a haunting reminder that some dreams, no matter how grand they are, may come at too great a cost or may simply be impossible to realize. Atlantropa was a breathtaking blend of genius and hubris, a vision that went far beyond just building a dam, aiming instead to redesign the Earth itself. To some, it was a bold leap toward a new civilization. To others, a polite apocalypse waiting to unfold. Hermann Sergel's dream with all its ambition and scale ultimately faded into a curious footnote in engineering history. But its legacy lives on as a powerful warning. The risks of tampering with nature on such a vast scale are immense and unpredictable. Atlantropa reminds us that just because we can imagine reshaping the world doesn't mean we should. The question lingers. Could humanity ever attempt something like this again? And if we did, would we survive the consequences?